We'll continue our study of the Nataraj this evening and explore more of its secrets. This is a very recent statue. It comes from the Chola Kingdom period in, the, in classical India in the early ADs, way long after the ancient period of the Vedic and the pre-Vedic culture. Originally, it was forbidden to make any uh, imagery of Shiva, and the only way Shiva was presented was as the famous Shiva Lingam, that oval stone that uh, you see in, in Shiva temples, not as a person, not as a, a deity. And there's a reason for that, and, and that is that the word Shiva, which is the earliest name for the supreme source of our being, is it means zero. Shiv literally means zero, zero point. In India, they actually uh, they make the zero with a point. They don't use the oval. What happened is that the Arabs or the Muslims who uh, invaded India learned about the zero because in the West there was no zero or in the Middle East they didn't have that. You remember Roman numerals and uh, uh, there's no zero in, in Roman mathematics which held back scientific progress in the West tremendously. And when the concept of zero was brought to the West from India, it was revolutionary. And it became the basis for all of uh, what is now taken for granted as modern mathematics, which could not exist without the concept of zero, nothingness. But it was not there prior uh, to its being retrieved in the West from India. And... Uh, <clears throat> the Shiva Lingam became uh, the icon uh, of zero in uh, the Western numerology. So you are you are making a uh, an Arabic version of a Shiva Lingam every time you write a zero. And of course, it's the same symbol that's in the Kaaba stone in Mecca. And because it also has the shape of a candle flame, it became the ner tamid, or the eternal light, in uh, the Jewish synagogue, and is above the Ark of the Torah. And so the, the zero point is both the flame, the fire, the agni, that uh, gives birth to all that is, that emerges from the fire, and the fire of purification, and uh, cremation into which all returns. And so you have the ring of fire here to signify that planetary destructive fire at the end of time, but which is also the stargate of the fire of the new creation that is being brought into being. But what's important is that not only did the concept of zero enter Western mathematics, it entered Western theology. And it, it entered uh, even before the, uh, the Arab invasion because there was contact between uh, the, uh, the, the Greeks and the Indians, in fact, the earlier Egyptians and the Indians. There was... Uh, the East did meet the West back in the ancient world, and so the, uh, the zero was already present uh, in the esoteric schools, and gradually zero or nothing became the primary name of God in the West. If you read uh, Christian mysticism, uh, it, is, it is clear that nothing is the primary name of God for Christians. The same as Shiva. You read Meister Eckhart, it's all through it. You read Marguerite Porret, you, you, you read Gregory of Nyssa, you read uh, Gregory Palamas, you read uh, Dionysius the Areopagite. All of them uh, who come from the Neoplatonic tradition, uh, because Alexander the Great, you remember, when he got to India, he learned all of this and it was brought back uh, into, uh, into Greece from India back then, and, uh, and it became a, a, a Greek philosophy called Pyrrhonism that uh, 
said that we have to nullify all of our beliefs if we are going to encounter the reality of our being. And that became the basis of what later be called skepticism. But skepticism itself is already a degradation because that's a belief that you shouldn't believe. But what Peronism was, was you have to go beyond both belief and disbelief to a state of consciousness that is nothingness. It contains no thought. And that's when you encounter that level of consciousness that is the God Self. It is a nothingness that is transcendent of thought, not that is not capable of thought. It's not the, the lower nothingness that is lack and defect and incoherence, but supercoherence that uh, intuitively knows everything without having to think it out in some kind of logical form. It is, it is all-knowing, and that all-knowingness comes from the nothingness, which became, again, the same concept in Buddhism, shunyata, that nothingness or emptiness that is the core concept of Buddhism, and you'll find it in Taoism, the Wuji, and, uh, and you'll find it uh, in, in Islam and Sufism. It's, it's all the same. There's really only one religion uh, it, throughout the world. They are exactly identical. When you study Buddhism, Advaita Vedanta, Taoism, uh, Islam, Christianity, Judaism, at least in its Kabbalistic form, and I would say also in its ancient Essene form, they are all the same exact religion. They correspond point for point. Uh, they, they are simply using different linguistic terminology and cultural mythologies to elaborate that point. But the point is the attainment of nothingness, of a mind empty of thought, so that the fullness of that which transcends thought can fully emerge in your consciousness and awaken you to that dimension of the real that the logical mind cannot comprehend and, uh, and has, in a sense, fallen away from through the use of language rather than the direct intuitive knowing of the real. And so the, the concept uh, that is being expressed here is a concept of, of, of uh, transcending the dwarf's form of thinking, which is that of linear two-valued thought, good and evil, the tree of the, the knowledge of good and evil for that transcendent real that is truth, that, that is beyond good and evil and beyond being and non-being a nothingness that contains all. There, it, I don't know if this particular version of Nataraj has enough detail to notice it, but uh, the uh, Shiva here is wearing two earrings. On one side it's a male earring and on the other side it's a female earring. This is a version of Ardha Narishvara, which means the Lord who is half woman. That it is understood that God is not the father only, but the mother, the, the source that contains both the yin and the yang, the masculine and the feminine, love as well as wisdom and truth, and, uh, and that there is a complete balance, not uh, any... Uh, superiority of a, a patriarchal form, but uh, a power that is, uh, expresses the wholeness beyond gender difference. Another aspect, well, of course, you have the, the wild flowing hair uh, that, uh, of, the, of the sadhu, and in the hair is the Ganga, the holy river Ganges that flows down, which is the, uh, the water of human kindness, the water of life that uh, is given from the head of Shiva. Life comes out of the source of being. It is fire, but it is also water. So you have both elements. And then, of course, you have the earth element. You have the air as mind 
and you have the ether in, in which this uh, nothingness, uh, which is also the unified quantum field, gives birth to the quantum wave functions that produce the forms of the world. Another aspect of this that I think is important is the, the four hands. And if you, again, you notice two uh, legs, four arms, and the head, you have seven. You have this same sevenfold uh, aspect of the Godhead. But the, uh, the, the forward left hand, which is you know, moving downward, which is backed up by the, its back left hand, which is holding the Agni, the sacred fire. This hand is called the Danda Hasta Mudra, which represents a, an elephant trunk. And it represents Ganesha. Ganesha is the son of Shiva. And so the message here is that just as in Christianity, the Son of God is one with the Father. The Son is the expression of the Father. The Son's job is the destroyer of obstacles. What is the obstacle? The ego. And the ego becomes destroyed through the recognition of its futility, its stupidity, its incoherence. And it is burned away, it is annihilated. And in the death of the ego, comes the emergence of God consciousness again. In the same way, in the other pair of arms, you have the, uh, the, the, the back arm is the damaru, time. But time is an illusion. It, there is uh, eternity in which the illusion of time is contained, but because time, the word is kal, which is the same word for death, uh, is an illusion, Shiva is known as Mahakal, the great death, the death of the illusion of death. And therefore the forward arm on that side is saying, be not afraid. Death is a myth, an illusion. There is no death for the real self. Fear not anything in this phenomenal uh, world which is uh, simply a show, a leela, a play, and, uh, and uh, nothing should ever be able to disturb you. So the, we have in the middle of world destruction uh, a, a message, don't take this seriously, nothing is being destroyed that is real, this is only a holographic illusion, and soon there will be a, a paradise that will appear. But we have to go through this, which tests our faith in that nothingness that transcends all that seems to appear, because the real nothing, because remember the world is a reflection in the mirror of God, is actually made of nothing. What is a quantum wave function? It's nothing, there's nothing material to it. There's no reality to it. That's why the Buddhists say that the world is empty. It's a flux, nothing stays the same. There is nothing real to hold on to. And in this constantly moving illusion, the only way that we can remain at peace and understand it is to let go of any attempt to try to grasp or hold on. You cannot catch the wind. You, you cannot uh, capture reality through the attempt of the mind to uh, conceptualize it or of the uh, attempt to, uh, to control any objects or beings in the world. There's no possibility of that. The only empowerment comes from withdrawing into the nothingness and realizing that that nothing is all encompassing, all containing, and all creating, but without any need for anything from its own reflection. And so therefore one attains freedom and swatantriya or independence. And through realizing that the world is empty of any essence, there's nothing to be gained from any uh, experience 
There, there is only uh, gain from the annihilation of the ego that wants to experience things in order to get some kind of fuel, some kind of stimulation, some kind of identity uh, from someone else, some kind of validation. The only real validation comes from the realization of the God-Self, not from anything you can get externally and the best you can get externally is someone pointing you to the God-Self. That's the role of the guru function. But not to then uh, bow and worship the guru, but to recognize that the real guru is within all, equally. And uh, there is no hierarchy when it comes to the truth of our being. Hierarchies are all within the relative frame of reference of organizational logic, but has nothing to do with the truth of our being in which all of us are equally and fully manifestations of God and therefore absolutely perfect, regardless of the role that the ego might be playing in the world. That has nothing to do with who you are and what you are. And so whatever role that might be is within the perfection of the intelligence of the God-mind. And that is why then this uh, cobra appears, which represents both the kundalini, the kundalini risen, and the conquest of the passions, the cobra that can poison, bite you and, bite you and poison you and, uh, and, uh, and kill you, that has been conquered. So once you have realized the God-Self and the, the emptiness of the world that has nothing to offer you, the only real offering comes from the source, then nothing can tempt you, nothing can distract you, nothing can take your heart from the God-Self and pour it into any object of desire. You belong to that source and you manifest that power in the world that keeps you uh, totally stable and able to move through the world with grace. So this, uh, th this image is enabling you to reach uh, the level of consciousness of timelessness and formlessness. And in the same way that Christ is uh, half God, half man, or all God and all man, if you wish, uh, the, the, the image of Ganesha is both human and, and half human, half elephant, if you will. Uh, but the elephant represents that superhuman power uh, of nature uh, of, to, uh, to create uh, beings that, that are monumental. And it, it, it represents that incorporeal greatness of the self that can manifest even in a very ordinary form. But it is, it is this recognition that no matter how uh, your form is, you are always the manifestation of the formless. And so never get worried about what you look like or how you appear to others. It is only your non-appearing, qualityless self that is real. That's the whole meaning of nirgun, Brahman. Brahman, which is the impersonal version of the same absolute consciousness, means without qualities. Without qualities means nothing. So it is that nothingness that is beyond the creation, not less than or a defective version of but that which is beyond and has no need to condescend to exist or to take form. And the only way that this infinite consciousness could possibly take form is as an entire cosmos because its absolute simplicity contains infinite potentiality. <coughs> And therefore, the cosmos is the work of art. I wouldn't say it's a result of vanity so much as of creative intelligence and joy in, in creating infinite forms of beauty and enabling those to be shared with a multiplicity of versions of the self 
in order to increase and augment the amount of joy and bliss in the world to infinite proportions. And so it is, it is all about joy and it is all about beauty, goodness and truth. It's not about suffering. But once the dwarf comes in, who through the, the being conquered by beauty and wanting to possess it because it has forgotten its qualityless nature and has taken it mistakenly as a defect and a lack, uh, has entered into a state through the power of its own consciousness because it believes in its lack of being, now it has a lack of being. It has created an egoic structure of consciousness that in fact has fallen into illusion and ignorance of its own nature. But that had to happen in order for the joy of the revelation of that nature again to be able to appear. So without ignorance, you wouldn't have the astonishment of awakening and illumination, and who would want that, right? So uh, there has to be this cycle of day and night, awakening and falling into the sleep of ignorance, and then awakening again. And this Nataraj represents the moment of awakening. And the moment of awakening to the God Self also happens to be the moment of the destruction of the world of the dwarves and the restoration of the world of the gods and goddesses who uh, will be the avatars of that nothingness and who will be able to maintain that level of awakened consciousness for another age so that uh, life becomes again a, a party, a place of total joy and absolute magical capacities that have atrophied because we have projected our desire for magic into technology. And so we, we prefer the magic of an iPhone to the magic of telepathic communication with each other without needing any phones, all right? And uh, we somehow prefer Facebook to the faceless self that uh, can have its internet connection with everyone. But it's that holy communion in which all of us are once again connected to one another without the intermediary of computers and uh, of electricity that enables the world to function with absolute perfection without getting in each other's way or our own way because our own consciousness has become incoherent. But to make all of the fragments of consciousness coherent, they all have to point to the same source. They have to point toward the nothing that has emanated them into apparent uh, beingness or at least becomingness. And that can only happen if all of the fragments of your ego simultaneously rise in love with God, okay, with, this, with the source. They're never going to love each other because they're antagonistic fragments in the same way that uh, you, they, there will be two norths of the magnet that will never come together. The, uh, the elements of the ego are in conflict. And, uh, and they all want different things. And that's why the, the ego had to dissociate from its own center in order to be able to uh, develop and maintain conflicting goals because it wanted to satisfy the demands of different people and, uh, and different forces within the social order which required uh, different sub-personalities. But once we recognize that we are not subjected to that order except voluntarily and we decide to surrender to God rather than the big other of society or the mid medium other of a family system, then we will once again have the power of the love of that source drawing us back into that core of the zero point and all of the ego fragments will melt in the fire of purification and the God Self will reemerge as who you are with the knowledge that this is who you have always been and cannot be any different because the Self is changeless 
and beyond time or space or form and therefore beyond being a thing that could be changed. The self is not a composite, it's not made of parts. And its absolute simplicity then is never disturbable by any events. So this is the consciousness that we are to regain through meditation. But we can only do that when we recognize that there is a level of consciousness transcendent of thought. And we have such a level of curiosity about it that we want to know who am I who is beyond thought and creating thought so that higher kinds of thought, more intelligent thoughts, can be put into the mind from that source, rather than the repetitive thoughts that have been placed on the tape machine of the mind in childhood and through a faulty educational system, but the thoughts that come directly from the source that are accurate and that can therefore understand the universe. So it is an educational process to let go of all of the beliefs that the ego has and is in order to recognize the non-egoic self, uncreated, ungendered, without form, without any objective correlative that is pure presence, pure awareness, pure intelligence, pure light, pure love. And that is what emerges within everyone if you are willing to discover who you really are and not settle for an illusory self-image that you've been told you are or that others want you to be for their sake. When you are free to discover and to abide as who you are, you will discover that you are none other than the supreme beingness. Not a person the, the jnani, the one who gains the knowledge, gains it at the cost of believing him or herself to be a separate person. There is only jnana, not a jnani. This is a very important point. The knowledge that is gained in God consciousness can never be appropriated by an ego who will then feel superior and try to use that knowledge to gain control over others. It's a fail-safe method. You can pretend to do that, but the moment that the ego comes back and wants to say, I am God, and, and say that from the perspective of an embodied being, all of that knowledge is lost. And, and one is, uh, is back in the imprisonment of a megalomaniac ego with, with psychopathic tendencies, but without any power to effect the, uh, the power of, of God. And so it is, uh, it is important that we uh, respect the truth and not try to uh, have a pretense of the gaining of God consciousness as an egoic formed being, but therefore the humble surrender to the God self that transcends any individual form and the recognition of that God self manifesting through everyone is an essential ethical element of the, the spiritual journey toward truth and love and the, the recognition that there is nothing special about any particular being. And the only real specialness comes from the destruction of the belief in that separate being. And so, interestingly, your salvation comes from your annihilation. And the two are the same. And so, therefore, the Mahakal, the great death, is also the eternal light and life. And you can't have one without the other. Okay, I think that covers the main symbols. Uh,
there's a lot more to we could go into. The sacred Veshti that is flowing here uh, is the, uh, the kind of a um, clothing that a Brahmin priest would wear, but the Brahmin, and he also has the, uh, the, th the sacred thread of the Brahmin, but this is, there are, you see, two threads that become one. It is the, uh, the unification of duality, and that brings one into the highest level of human consciousness, which in the Vedic uh, conceptualization of society was the Brahman. The Brahman represented that class of beings who, uh, for Plato in his Republic, would be called the philosopher kings. They are the, or the prophets in the Hebrew uh, tradition. The prophets are not the kings. The philosopher kings are not the actual rulers. The Brahmins don't want any power, but their wisdom is such that uh, they can veto any mistaken uh, laws made by the king or the parliament or whatever because their wisdom is recognized by the social order. And, and thus the society can be kept on an even keel and accurately and uncorruptibly moving through time so long as there is a class of beings dedicated to being in God consciousness and who are not interested in rule or in wealth or in uh, prestige or power of any other sort than the transmission of wisdom. And this gave birth to uh, the whole idea of, uh, of, a, of a class of wise beings raised separately uh, from, uh, from those who would be involved in uh, political power, military power, mercantile uh, success and profit, or uh, any of the other uh, classes of society. And these are the shamans within a, a tribal context. And the shamans are very often transgender. They, they cannot be identified as either male or female. There is the transcendence of desire which takes one beyond uh, the limitations of, uh, of the erotic differential that brings about desire and fear. And so this state of consciousness brings peace and it, it creates a, a space of a sanctuary of a holy temple in which all can come and feel safe. If there is not a place in society where all can come for refuge, then the society becomes a, a jungle in, in which uh, th there is not an ability to overcome paranoia. And once that was lost, once the, the function of the Brahmins as a social order wa was uh, degraded and, uh, and no longer uh, able to function accurately, then society became much more violent. And uh, in order to eliminate uh, feuds and, uh, and conflicts between members of society who would often fight over a woman or over uh, a hunt, a prey, or, or some uh, finding of a treasure or whatever, whatever that conflict was, it would only then be able to be resolved through sacrifice. There would have to be a ritual killing, whether of an animal in some cases, or of a, a human sacrifice. And so that sacrificial order replaced the original order of the sacrifice of the ego that would enable society to have a safe place in which differences could be resolved, mediated, uh, arbitrated, and determined peacefully without the need for violence. But once violence came in, then there was a need for uh, the sacrificial action, and gradually the, the sacrifices uh, were not sufficient to uh, appease the bloodlust of people who, whose anger was now out of control in the dwarf consciousness and wars began and uh, out of control social systems. So this was the original will of God to keep the society at peace and, and able to uh, resolve its conflicts 
with wisdom and with love and not with violence. And it's that return to nonviolence, to a communal nonviolence, a community that is a, a refuge and a place where people can come to be unburdened by their inner conflicts and outer ones that is the function of the ashram or the monastery in, in Western terms. And it is that function of the monk or of the yogi to be able to maintain an oasis of peace even uh, in a world at war. And so we are continuing that great tradition and hoping that these oases from the grassroots will uh, gradually uh, sprout up in all various uh, regions of the planet and give birth to a new network of uh, peaceful social orders that are integratable and in harmony with that supreme principle of love and truth. And so you're all invited to be a part of this great movement of awakening and uh, the creation of these oases of peace that the world itself is meant to be. Namaste. So the floor is open if anyone has any comments, questions. Yes. I have just a doubt about the Ganges River, you just said. Uh -huh. Yes. Um, that it's like represents like the hair of, of Shiva. Mm -hmm. But in the case of Vishnu, it's like the seven snakes that it's always protecting Vishnu. Is it the same? Yes, yeah, the same. This cobra represents all seven of those. Those are the seven chakras. And There's also a, a creature with seven uh, snake heads in the apocalypse. Mm -hmm. Is yeah. it the same thing? Same thing. Yeah, same imagery goes throughout all the religions. You'll see it in, in Buddhism as well. Why snakes? Well, uh, first of all, the, the snake is a very uncanny creature that is able to move uh, in, in ways that are extraordinary without legs or arms. And the kundalini has the same wave function. And the, the yogis recognize that the universe is just made up of waves. That's all it is cosmic waves, quantum waves, and the snake represents the wave function of the movement of the energies within the body, up the chakras, the kundalini, that eventually light up the third eye, the pineal gland. And so it, it, the snake was a perfect uh, image of uh, that uh, animated wave that moves gracefully through the world, silently, and can strike uh, uh, instantly from uh, the secret depths of the grass and, and uh, it, is, uh, it is a creature that has always uh, created awe in the minds of, of humans. And that's why the snake charming uh, modality became so famous in India and you still see that, that, that there are snake charmers who will use a cobra and they will kiss the cobra on the head and, and the cobra will recognize uh, its, uh, its power and will not strike, even though it could kill the person, but it will uh, abide by, by that recognition of love and honoring of its being. It's also true that <clears throat> uh, nirvana actually means beyond waves. So when the wave function of the kundalini reaches the crown chakra, the waves stop. The, the brain waves literally flatline. That's when you get into the final state of samadhi and you have an out-of-body experience or even an out-of-dimension experience. And there are no waves. If someone is measured on an oscilloscope, their brain waves will show non-activity, even though a great deal is happening, but it's happening in that dimension of the noumenal, not of the phenomenal. Mm -hmm. So along those lines of um, this Nataraj actually being significant of all the religions that we're just talking about, um, you said that your salvation comes from your own annihilation, meaning your ego death. Mm -hmm. Correct. So then when Christ 
Christ was crucified on the cross, that mm -hmm. was, it's not that he saved us, it's showing us that we have to save ourselves such as he did. That's right. He's a metaphor for every man, every, every being. And that's why after Christ, Jesus is crucified, not Christ, Jesus. And, and uh, the esoteric Christians make a distinction. The Christ soul, that, that being of light, did not uh, do any bad karma to suffer, whereas Jesus may have. Uh, so um, the, uh, the crucifixion of the ego, the, of the Jesus, in order for the ascension of the Christ, first had to, uh, the, after the crucifixion and the death of Jesus, he had to go to hell for three days. He went through the harrowing of hell. He had to kill all the demons in hell. This means he had to destroy his shadow. That's what the hell realm is. It's the realm of the shadow. So once your ego has been crucified and died, then the, your unconscious becomes totally conscious. You can't run away from it anymore, and you have to slay all of those demons, but now you have the power to slay them because you are now a being of light who is no longer influenced by those temptations. And, uh, and then it's after the three days in hell that, uh, that Christ rises into the light and ascends to the right hand of God, the right hand being that hand of be not afraid of the hand of blessings, right? So it is, it is a, a process that represents the psychological process of all of us. It's not a historical document in the Gospels, but it's a, a teaching uh, about what each of us has to go through. So then when you say, into, into thy hands I command my spirit, it's the surrender. Uh -huh. That's right, the surrender of your consciousness. Once you let go of the ego, what you are doing is entering into the void of infinite consciousness. And there's a terror of infinity. And so uh, there has to be, at that moment of transition, while there is still a sense of individuality, but nothing to hold on to any longer, uh, there has to be faith in surrendering to the void because one will go through one's own annihilation, literally. And it will be either terrifying or blissful, depending on your level of faith. Okay. Does, does this mean that uh, the true slaying the demons starts after the um, ego death? Let's put it this way. Most of the demons you won't even know about until the censor has been killed, right? Because it remains subconscious or you will only know the demons in projected form or karmic form, but the actual root of demonic sanskaras or tendencies of the soul lie very hidden in the depths of our subconscious. And so it's really only when uh, the ego has been destroyed that we can dive that deep down into the ocean of consciousness. And, uh, and retrieve both the pearl of great price that's down there and destroy the demonic entities that are keeping it from us. So uh, yes, I, I think it's very uh, much the case that it's after, at least after the first levels of ego death, that the real uh, deep uh, destruction of the sanskaras happens, that they're burned away at the core. Before that, you can cut off the heads of the demons, but they'll grow new heads, right, like the hydras. And that's why people who have gone through psychoanalysis, all, they all come here and say, oh, I've already done that, I've dealt with all my traumas. And then they come up again and they say, oh my God, I thought I was done with all of that. No, they weren't done with that. They were just done with the surface level of it. And when you really get to, down to the real demon in, in the depths, they're tough. And, uh, and they can't be killed except by a laser Vajra beam of uh, total divine energy. Nothing else will do it. How to enchant this, this uh, the Agni fire, the fire which will burn those uh, demons? And... How to build the fire? Yes. Okay. Silence. Silence builds it. It's through the refusal to think that the, the concentration, you know, concentration is like a, a, uh, a magnifying glass. You know, if you want to set something on fire, you put a magnifying glass and the sun goes through it, right? 
So the light of consciousness, once there is silence, gets a laser beam-like magnification. And that's when it's able to burn the demons. But, and what you'll find is when you're silent, the pineal gland will light up, your whole brain will light up, there'll be a tremendous pressure, there'll be a fire. It's literally destroying the demons that are in the neurons of the brain and, uh, and dissolving them and enabling the whole nervous system to function differently from that place of, uh, of true knowledge and uh, of harmony with nature. So the, uh, the ego mind has to be destroyed in the body itself. And that will happen through the sustaining of the silence and the refusal to, uh, to distract your mind into the levels of thought that, in which the demons will then control you again, right? And so the refusal to think is the refusal to allow uh, the demons to seduce you and entertain you and distract you from what you're doing. And when you cannot be distracted, that's when the power destroys them utterly. No, go ahead. But uh, does this, um, uh, this refusal from uh, distraction, even the slightest movement of the body when you are... No, it has nothing to do with the body. Don't worry about the body. It's the mind that you don't want to move. The body can move. That's why you can meditate while you're dancing or cooking or what, doing whatever work you're doing. It has nothing to do with the state of the body. It's the state of presence in which you're not spacing out or having daydreams or fantasies. You're totally present. And it's in that absolute presence then that only divine consciousness can, can uh, settle in the brain. It's that willingness to abide as pure presence that, that transforms everything. Okay? But the body can move. It's just you don't want brain waves to move. Okay. I have a question. Mm -hmm. um, on a day-to-day -day basis, because of our, our working life, etc., it's very hard to just stay in the moment. We have so many different things to do. We're overly... No, busy. it's not. That's an excuse. Is it? Yeah. yeah. You see, your mind will try to convince you of that and justify not being in a meditative state. There's no truth to it. And, uh, and Ramana said that, and Ananda Ma and all of them. And that's why there, there's, uh, there's no busier place in the world than an ashram. And, uh, and, and yet, that's exactly what we're learning, is that while we're working hard for hour after hour, our mind can be in total silence and, and undisturbed by whatever the body is doing, because you're not the body. And once you have been able to put the body on automatic pilot, the intuitive knowledge of, uh, of your intense consciousness will make sure you function without a glitch. It's only when the ego is spacing out that you start being careless and then mistakes get made. But when you are absolutely silent and present, you don't make mistakes. And you are in a state of bliss. And, and it doesn't matter how much the body is working. And in fact, the body will have more life energy to work than ever before. Because the ego isn't saying, ah, this is too much. I want to go home. I want to eat some cookies. You know, it's not going to create those kinds of distractions and resistances. And so you'll be able to accomplish a, a tremendous amount more and more effectively and beautifully than you would be able to do if you were in an ego state. So don't believe your mind. Your ego mind is deceiving you. There are no excuses. You can be enlightened no matter what your life situation is. Yes. You spoke uh, this morning a few times. You mentioned the word innocence. Mm -hmm. And I think the word innocence is very misinterpreted, perhaps by our society. It's a, a much higher state than mm -hmm. you were referring to. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see if you could speak a little more about it. Innocence? In a sense. <laughs> but in no sense can it be described accurately. Uh, because uh, innocence is uh, not naivete, it's not gullibility, uh, it's not a lack of experience, but it is a rebirth into the truth of our being that has never entered into the created world. 
And so the innocence is the uncreated self, the unborn, <coughs> the, the undefiled, the undegraded real of what we are that reawakens to its own nature and then is able to live in the world without judgments, without projections, without the defilement uh, of any other being, but the recognition of the innocence of all and the perfection of all and the godhood of all. And so the innocence is, I would say, the ultimate attainment of consciousness, not the state we start out with, although it says be as little children in that sense, before children are, are tempted by eros or uh, by all of the other social uh, uh, demands and uh, offerings of, of political and financial power, etc. But it is uh, an innocence that is, is simply the, uh, the automatic and natural expression of love and uh, creativity, which is our being. It's about that. And in that state, then, uh, wonders emerge. Uh, we will be in a, a constant state of astonishment, of joy, uh, because every moment is new and everything is infinitely interesting and beautiful, whether it's the insects or the plants or the, the clouds or the sunsets or whatever. The world is filled with beauty, infinite beauty, and that innocence is the capacity to drink in that beauty and express it and dance it and sing it and be completely uninhibited in one's expression of love and joy. So we have to be willing to shine and uh, not be inhibited or hiding uh, who we are from the world or from ourselves. Okay. Yes? Can you think about curiosity? Ah, curiosity. It's not good for cats. <laughs> There's a natural curiosity that the ego has in wanting to understand how things work, okay? And, and those things include bodies and include uh, machines and include all, all of those kinds of, of things because our intelligence is externalized into uh, a focus upon the phenomenal plane, upon that which appears. And so the ego is that aspect of consciousness that is adapted to a, a desire to understand and master the phenomenal plane, the creation. But there's another level of curiosity which comes uh, at a more mature level of the development of consciousness that wonders, well, who am I who is, has the curiosity about the world? Where does that come from? Who am I in the sense of what is consciousness itself? And once your consciousness becomes awakened to the fact that you are actually the most mysterious being in the world, not all of that which you can master through objective intelligence, but that requires a subjective uh, sensibility to the subtlest nuances of your own, uh, your own mind, your own heart. And, and you realize that at, from an ego level, you can't understand yourself. You don't know why you're doing what you're doing, why you reacted the way you reacted to certain things and certain people. Uh, and you become curious about what makes you tick, what makes your mind have those kinds of reactions. And who are you behind all of the conditionings that were put into your mind in childhood or even in the prenatal period? Who are you in your original self? Once that curiosity gets activated, which is also what we call the upper death drive, because you want to die to the conditioned self to discover the unconditioned self, that curiosity becomes a, a, a yearning that, that, that has to be fulfilled. It becomes more important than anything else you can do. And the curiosity that had been externalized is now completely internalized. 
so that the, the full power of your ability to know yourself is actualized. And then in the satisfaction of that curiosity through the discovery of your divine nature, then you become curious on how that true nature of yours can be used to heal the world. How, how, how can I become a catalyst for the healing of suffering souls or a, a planet in a, in a state of destruction and moribund webs of nature? How can I be uh, a, an agent of uh, positive change and transformation and restoration of the divine beauty of the world? So the curiosity moves in those three phases. And then finally, it is satisfied through the absolute understanding of the God self. And, and curiosity comes to an end and is, is simply replaced by that infinite uh, uh, radiance and splendor of the self that through its mere being effects the transformation of its own dream which is the universe. And it's that last level of revelation and redemption that is the fulfillment of our real curiosity. Is that helpful? Good. Um, one thing I'm confused by in today's talk is um, the void or the nothingness mm -hmm. of the infinite is called attributeless or mm -hmm. qualityless. Mm -hmm. And yet, um, we also talk about beauty and infinite knowledge, intelligence, and um, truth as being. It seems to me qualities of the divine. They emerge from the nothingness, but you can never know their source. You know only their emergent properties. You know the explicate order, and you know that the explicate order of the world must depend on an implicate order, but you cannot know that order with the same mind that you know the explicate order. It is unknowable by the mind that wants to grasp things conceptually. It cannot be known because you are it. And that's why the world has to exist as the reflection of God. The beauty can appear only in the world, but the actual beauty is the self that is formless. But we think of beauty as the beauty of forms, right? But it is actually the formless intelligence and love that creates the beauty of form and reflects that beauty. And so, but you cannot know the formless directly with the same level of mind. You have to transcend that mind and enter the nothingness, the unknowable self, unknowable as an object. It's not a thing, it's a no thing. But you are that no thing, and you are that qualityless presence. Once you have disidentified from the body and the self images that the ego has, you are imageless. And you are formless, and, and, but you are filled with infinite intelligence and love and power. And it's unobstructed once you have entered the nothingness. But the somethingness obstructs, it creates the obstacles that keep you as a limited somebody instead of the nothing that is everything. Okay. Yes. You mentioned technology and you were mentioning Facebook how technology has completely changed our generation. I just mm. wanted to know your thoughts about what you foresee in the future. Do you feel it's going to get worse? And <laughs> Can't get much worse. Well, we're not going to keep going the way we're going. That's the whole point of it. Uh, uh, in every uh, scripture, whether it's the Bhagavad Gita or uh, the Buddhist scriptures or the New Testament or the Book of Revelations, it, every, uh, every scripture says words to the effect that when things get really bad on, on, in the world, I'm coming back, okay? <laughs> like the Terminator, right? 
And, and that's God's role. Shiva is the terminator, right? That's his role, destruction. Uh, and he's going to make sure that the suffering comes to an end and take the world out of its misery. So it's not going to be allowed to go on much longer the way it's going because too many people are suffering and oppressed. And there's already a planetary subconscious desire of the masses to get this over with because there's no way out. They're starving. They're, they're unable to, to have any rights, any, any voice in the world. They, they are being stamped uh, upon and, and they, they will, will do not tolerate it but they are, they are creating an energy field in which that um, massive uh, self-destruction is becoming the force that is moving the political world uh, toward its insanity uh, of, of creating a conflict between uh, the West and Russia and China. Uh, and uh, these uh, powers have the ability to thermonuclear destroy the world within about nine minutes. Uh, there are enough hypersonic nuclear delivery systems that will destroy uh, nearly all the population centers of the world just like that. And if you're near ground zero, you get incinerated before you even feel the pain of the nuclear fire of this ring of fire. You're gone. Uh, so in a way, it's the most merciful death. The great death, the Mahakal, is on his way, okay? But it is also what happens to the souls who die in that conflagration all in one day, an, a massive die-off of the human population. Those souls come back to the light and they return to bliss. And then there will be another cycle, starting with a very small population. But it will be a new time and we'll have amnesia, just like we now have amnesia for our past, most people don't know our real history, and history is not taught accurately in schools. And, and prior to ancient Egypt, they don't know anything about history, but they do know we had higher technology then uh, than we have now, because we can't build pyramids now. There's no way we could even uh, try to accomplish that, or let alone other of the old wonders of the ancient world. But uh, this, uh, this cycle is coming to an end, and a new age is going to begin. The Mayans say that, and the Aztecs, and the Incas, and all of the, the, the peoples of uh, both hemispheres. And, and so it's, it's written into the legends and the mythology uh, of every, every religion, every tradition, that the Mahdi is coming, or Maitreya, or the final Buddha, the final Kalki, avatar of Vishnu, the, the second coming of Christ, the, the Messiah in the Jewish tradition, whatever, they're all saying that, that there, will, there will come a final revelation, and then that's the end and a new beginning. Uh, and so that's the, the moment we're coming to, the singularity in which uh, things can't get any worse. They are already collapsing and we're in the middle of the, what they call the sixth extinction. There's a massive die-off of the species of the world. There are no more bees uh, in the world. We're lucky. We have an oasis where the bee colonies actually are thriving thanks to Jagdish's love for them and, and, and uh, some others who are, are, are giving that life energy to these beautiful beings. But uh, if you don't have bees, you're not going to have pollination. You're soon not going to have fruits and vegetables and nuts and all the things that depend on, uh, on the, the work of the bees. And so the food sources will soon be gone. And as we all know, there's drought in most of the world and fires and uh, floods in other parts of the world and freezing and earthquakes and volcanoes. The amount of destructive activity of nature is unparalleled today and it's exponentially increasing. Gaia is about to knock all the fleas off of her back and, and, and the humans are gonna participate in that. But land masses that we take for granted as continents will go underwater because they'll be radiated and they'll have to, to be purified. And other land masses will come up from under the sea and the earth will look very different in a few years. And I'm not talking about many generations. I'm talking about within your lifetime. And, and maybe even very soon because the desire for this transformation is building up. And we are co-dreaming this dream. 
Things aren't happening by random chance or uh, political intrigue of ruling cabals, even though they may think that they are manipulating things. But the real puppet master is Shiva here, who is determining the destiny of everyone. And uh, that, uh, that moment of transformation is now very close. And so uh, that's why the urgency of awakening and of becoming part of what is being born, not part of what is dying, is, is so crucial for our own karma and our own destiny if we want to continue in the next cycle of time and be part of the new creation, because it's coming. But uh, it, to, to be aligned with that uh, means that we have gone through ego death and we are uh, manifesting the will and the love of God fully as our own life, not any ego uh, intermediary that wants its own desires to be fulfilled. The, the time of the ego is over, okay? It was an era. There weren't always egos. The ego is a, a, a transitory mental formation. And in the next age, we will all be egoless. That's what it means to be an avatar. You're egoless. It's pure divine consciousness that moves your body and mind through the world. There's no ego. And so we will have an egoless society. But only those who have already gone through the purification of the ego in this age will have the continuity of consciousness that will uh, enable that sense of immortality and power to, uh, to be able to be in resonance with the energy field that will be created in the next yuga, the Sat Yuga, the, the age of truth and of light and of being. And so uh, it's so important for us if we want to be part of, uh, of that movement of divinization of the world, to have gone through this rite of passage of ego death. Okay. But it's happening now, and uh, there's a lot of people in denial who don't want to think about this and want, and want to believe that we can ameliorate it and we'll muddle through, and Putin is too smart to launch missiles, and et cetera, et cetera. Well, it's not the case. Uh, and, uh, and as things get bad, the only way that uh, the political system knows how to react is by diverting attention to wars. And so we see more and more of these uh, happening. And uh, the deep state in the U.S. gets very upset when Trump pulls troops out of a war zone, you see. And, uh, and because he is only a, a front, he's not the real controlling power in, of the government, uh, the, uh, the, the powers that actually move the empire are moving toward greater and greater conflict, not toward peace. And so this is all going to erupt uh, in a moment of conflagration. And we want to not be in a state of horror uh, and of body consciousness. We want to be in God consciousness when that moment hits. Okay? So that's why the, uh, the importance of, of this, these kinds of understandings that need to be disseminated in the world so all who, who seek will know how to transform their consciousness before the end. Mm -hmm.